You can't change no. the past until it's been formed and it isn't formed till you look. So with that picture of the universe with the eye closing a, forming yeah. a closed circuit, the point is in this picture, the universe doesn't properly exist yeah. until the eye is look back on the universe. Now, not many physicists will believe that. They will think it's a too, too metaphysical. But it is, in some sense, an implication of the view that consciousness collapses the wave function. Yeah. But then you get into the question of, well, what is the consciousness collapsing the wave function? Because the critics will say, well, look, I can see the universe. I'm looking with my space, the James Webb t Space Telescope, and I'm seeing things in the universe before any human beings and possibly before any alien beings are ever formed. So how is this possible if, if there was no consciousness? In other words, how could the universe have existed before uh, there were any observers? But the counter argument is you've got to decide what you mean by consciousness, because yeah. consciousness of the little c may not have existed, but what about consciousness of well, the big, big c? Exactly. If mind was primary. Yeah. So and, and the idea of consistent history consistent histories, which is what we are talking about. It, it's not as weird as it sounds. And then, like Bernardo was explaining, uh, even if we know history, we know history only at a very coarse level, characters, events. We don't know the positions and trajectories of every elementary mm. subatomic particle yeah, yeah. corresponding to yeah, those macro yeah. events. Mm. So there are many, many, many possible histories paths that, of, of yeah. those paths that are consistent with what we do know. Yeah. So you can imagine that a consistent history is what you get when you take a magnifying glass and you look at the past with a microscope. And then those various possibilities that are consistent with the past at a coarse level, which you do know, they will collapse into one of them. One of those paths. Because yeah. you looked with a microscope uh, yeah. into them. And you're not changing that instantly you're not something changing else anything. because you the, change your past now. This is not yeah. any more crazy than the measure, measurement problem in the present already is. Yeah. Yeah. It's no more crazy than that. Yeah. It may be crazy, but it's no more crazy oh, yeah. than the one that we have in the present. Oh, how yeah, how does nice an idea. observation yeah. uh, produce one single result if all we have is the laws of large numbers in yeah. uh, uh, Schrodinger's equation? Yeah. I've right. often thought that even the, even the distinction between quantum and classical might be observant dependent because, um, in, in fact, a, a, feature of specious presence even, because, you know, the quantum in the, we classically an electron goes around a proton, but in quantum mechanics, it's, the electron doesn't go around the proton, it's actually a wave around the proton. Yeah. And that's rather reminiscent. Do you remember in my talk, I showed this light going round yeah. and how it goes and round it becomes, too fast, yeah. and, it's, and it sort of is basically a, a line. Well, this is rather like this proton, which instead of being a point going around, is a, is a, a, a circle. And so I've often thought, well, maybe the, the division between quantum and classical is something to do with the specious presence of the observer. And, and if that was the case, for a being with a much longer specious present, then a large, much larger domain of the world would appear to be quantum. Okay, because, I mean, it's got a longer time scale. On the other hand, with a being with a much smaller specious presence, a lot of the quantum world would appear classical. Yeah. Okay, this isn't mainstream physics, but it's often struck me there might be a link between, because that's a big issue in, in, in physics. What is the divide between the quantum... Yeah, where does it and, stop? And, yeah, and exactly, the classical exactly. realm? And, and uh, you know, George Ellis made a big thing about that. So we don't really know, because the point is that we. it's nice to say quantum mysteries just apply in the microscopic domain, but it's not as simple as that. We do know they propagate into the macroscopic domain, possibly brains, but certainly in biological systems. So the idea that in some sense, what is quantum and what is classical depends upon the, the, the nature of the observer, it, it doesn't sound to me completely crazy.